What happened here? I was boxing a martial arts and that burst my uh, tendon. Oh. I wish it was like a nice story of like an, an injury in war or something, but it's just a boxing <laughs> well, I, injury. You, you well, like to box? I enjoy it. It gets the energy out, oh, that's um, but true. I don't like getting punched in the face. I think no, that's what nobody does. We're going to talk about <laughs> geopolitics. Everyone likes to attack another country, but when the con other country retaliates, no one likes it anymore. Yeah, that's right. We're, yeah. we're talking about that. Um, Colonel, I think the, the most obvious question I'd ask you, something that we cover very closely on our show, is what we're seeing in the Middle East. Yes. Um, and I've been following it very closely, along with the, you know, I had Senator Johnson on, and we talked a lot about the Ukraine war. We've talked, I've talked to him before about the Ukraine war. But what we're seeing in the Middle East is slowly moving to a, potentially becoming a regional war. You can call it that already, technically. Um, what's your analysis of the current state of the war and how Israel eliminated Hezbollah's commanders and their entire communication system? And what do you think could happen next? Well, I'm glad we started with an easy question. Uh, I think, first of all, we are at the beginning of this regional war. What's been happening to this point uh, is not a regional war. This began because I think the Israelis uh, miscalculated on the 7th of October. I think there's some evidence that they may have allowed that attack to happen in the hopes that this would build support for a crusade on their part against Gaza. I think most people would have been satisfied with whatever they did over a week or two but when this campaign turned into a campaign of murder and uh, expulsion, I think the Israelis put themselves on a very dangerous path. So they, they now have a problem on the West Bank as well as in Gaza. And now in the, midst, in the middle of all of this, they are turning on Southern Lebanon, which they have always eyed as a potential expansion, but they want to destroy Hezbollah. The problem with all of this is that most of the Muslim world is watching and the Muslim world is led, in most cases, particularly the Arabs, by governments that are, by their very nature, fragile and did not want to go to war. But they're losing the battle for peace. Their populations are enraged, particularly in Jordan and Egypt. I will be surprised if those governments last much longer. Wow. At the same time, you have Iran that is committed to Hezbollah because they are also Shiites, just as they've supported the Houthis who are Shiites, you also have a similar situation in Iraq with Shiite militias. Uh, we have tended to treat all of this as mindless terrorism directed exclusively at Israel and us. That's an oversimplification. When we were fighting ISIS, the Shiite militias in Iraq and the Shiites coming out of Hezbollah in uh, southern Lebanon were allied with us against ISIS. They were of invaluable support for us. Now that that ISIS problem is largely but not completely defeated, we've now turned against them, largely because Israel has an agenda in the region. It wants to dominate. It's not enough to be a powerful and influential nation. They have decided that they want to settle all accounts with all potential adversaries. That's a very dangerous thing to do, and I think it's the path is now suicidal. But, e but Israel thinks that as long as it has unconditional support from us, that th they can do anything. The problem with unconditional support from us is that our resources really are limited. We don't have limited, limitless numbers of ships and soldiers, limitless missiles, and Iran is not alone. Iran is backed by Russia and China. You're talking about disrupting the flow of oil and natural gas out of the Persian Gulf potentially. Talking about destroying Iran, which is a nation that other countries want to do business with, it's very dangerous. How, how, how do you? So, it's interesting analysis. Um, there's two. There's kind of two arguments to be made. One of them is that Israel has no choice. I'll get you a bottle of water. Can I have one bottle, please? That's one of them. Hey, thanks. Um, so you said you have two theories. And both of them, you know, are worth considering. One of them is that Israel has no choice but to do what they did in Lebanon, considering Hezbollah involved themselves in, in the war in Gaza. So that's one argument. And then you've got the other argument, which is Israel wants to expand potentially their territory, and you've got the disputed territory up in South Lebanon. 
Um, and they just, this is a good opportunity to be able to do this. Is, Hezbollah gave them a reason to be able to do it and, and, and justify their actions. Which one do you think is more likely? Do you think they just they genuinely just want to wipe out Hezbollah, which is you know bombing their territory, or are they is it a part of a more sinister plan? Well, do the Israelis have to drive out or kill the inhabitants of Gaza? That's the first question. If they think they do, I don't think they do. I don't support campaigns of mass murder and expulsion. In other words, if there were two million Jews living in Gaza and the population in Palestine wanted to drive that, them out or kill them, I would oppose it. Do, do you understand? Yes. Yeah. I, I think we live in a world today where there is enough wealth, enough power distributed across the globe that we can find solutions without mass murder and expulsion. Now, the Israelis are saying they may have killed 39,000 people. I've seen figures 189,000 dead or larger. Right now, no one is telling the truth in the region about anything. So if you think the Israelis are going to tell you how many casualties they've had, how many losses they've sustained, how many people, men, women, and children they've killed, they're not going to volunteer that information. What I'm telling you is that the problem here is Gaza. And that's why Hezbollah has engaged against Israel, said we're, we're engaging the Israelis because they're murdering Muslim and Christian Arabs in Gaza. That's the argument. Now, Hezbollah w did not exist until the Israelis occupied southern Lebanon in 1982. That occupation ended after 18 plus years and Hezbollah rose from the ashes. Initially, when the Israelis went into southern Lebanon, you go back to 1982, they were welcomed by the Shiites because they were tired of the corruption, the chaos and the disorder in northern Lebanon. Well, <clears throat> now there's, everything in has southern changed. Lebanon. No, no, the, oh, northern. this is when the Shiites in the south were upset over the chaos and destruction in northern Lebanon. That's why they welcomed the Israelis. The Israelis wore out their welcome and suddenly turned people who were predisposed to cooperate with them into enemies. That enemy has grown into Hezbollah. Now they tried to go in there in 2006 they weren't prepared for what they encountered, and it did not go well. At that point, you could have made a decision. How do we defuse this issue with Hezbollah? I don't think they were interested in defusing it. They, they sat down and said, we have to annihilate it. And so I think you're in a war of annihilation against Hezbollah. You're in a war of annihilation against Gaza. And ultimately, eventually, a war of annihilation against the West Bank Arabs. That's what's unfolding. That's the problem, and the rest of the region is now unhinged. The rest of the region will not tolerate this. Then what, what do you think Iran will do? Because on, on, they seem, <clears throat> their biggest proxy was just destroyed. Whether you, 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 you're supportive of Israel's war against Israel, I think the, the, the way they've, they've targeted, they've calculated, the, the entire strategy of how they decimated their communication network, the way they've done it, created paranoia, Got the commanders to meet, killed all the commanders, killed the entire command line, the successors, and obviously killed the leader. Um, Hezbollah's being, fair to say, being wiped out right now, been completely night and destroyed. You really believe that? Do you just, okay, I'd love your take. So you think Hezbollah still has a lot of capacity? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. What happens when you remove a CEO from the corporation? You get a new one. You know, Israel has been assassinating people for years all across the region. What happens when you assassinate one leader? You get a new leader. Hezbollah is very well organized, highly networked, has lots of people in it who are very competent fighters. They are currently be, being reinforced from across the region by Arabs as far south as Yemen, as well as from Iraq and Syria, who are pouring in to reinforce and support Hezbollah. Hezbollah is not destroyed. Hezbollah is not finished not by a long shot. And Israel, is it, if it now goes in on the ground, somebody told me earlier today that they seems have. Seems about to, you know, they have, they've, they've signed a mass, so troops have signed it to amass, not only tanks, tanks and troops right at the border, so. Yeah, well, if they, once they go in, they are going to march into a hornet's nest. How many times have we bombarded enemies from the air 
with missile and bombs and so forth, only to discover that the enemy was not destroyed. The enemy was not dead, absolutely not. We went through this in World War II, we went through it in Korea, we went through it in Vietnam. We even saw it in Iraq in 1990 and 91. So I would be very careful not to interpret explosions on the television as evidence for victory. I don't think that's the case at all. The other thing is that you're asking, what will Iran do? It's going to wait for this five-day period of mourning to end before it does anything. Then I think you will see the Iranians act. But the trigger for them has always been a ground invasion. They've made it very clear to Hezbollah, take the bombardment. You're prepared for it. You're dug in hundreds of feet below the surface. Take the bombardment. If they come in on the ground, then we will engage. And I think you will see Iran directly attack Israel once it goes into southern Lebanon. That's scary to even imagine. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that's when that's our cue because we have carrier battle groups, over a thousand jet fighters. But isn't that enough to deter of, Iran? Yeah, they're, they're, okay. they're not there to deter, to attack. But that, so that, do you not think these carriers would deter Iran getting involved? This whole, this whole notion of deterrence is delusional. No one is deterred if they feel it's in their national interest, but if they feel that their existence is at stake, deterrence is irrelevant. Do you understand? If you push an enemy into a corner, you haven't deterred him. You've made him desperate. Iran is not going to be deterred from engaging in support of Hezbollah if the Israeli Defense Force goes in on the ground. The likelihood, in your opinion, of Israel and Iran reaching a peace agreement, essentially Iran being forced into a peace agreement now that all their proxies are being hit. I, I, look, you, you can bomb anybody you want. That doesn't give you victory. The Shiite militias in Iraq are not destroyed. The Shiite, Shiites that are armed and ready in Hezbollah are not destroyed. How, how, how much have we bombed the Houthis over the last several months? And every week you discover another tanker has been destroyed. Come on, wake up, smell the coffee. If you don't go in on the ground, you're not going to defeat anybody. Last question to you, Colonel. What should the U.S. do? How should the U.S. handle things in the state that it's in right now in the Middle East? Well, since as an American, I find the idea of mass murder and expulsion repugnant morally. I think most presidents that we've had in the past, Reagan pulled the plug on the Israelis in 82 and in Lebanon and elsewhere, told them no more massacres. This is when they were going after the PLO with Arafat. We arranged for Arafat to leave the country and the PLO to go out. In 1973, after the Egyptians fought very well, the Israelis finally crossed the canal and wanted to go straight into Cairo and completely destroy the state. We stepped in and said no. In the past, Russia and America have worked together to set limits to how far these wars could go. Hmm. Biden has set no limits. Biden okay. is unconditionally supporting whatever the Israelis want to do. And the Israel lobby has more influence on the Hill in Congress than President Biden or anybody else. So right now, the only way to stop this is to tell the Israelis, we are suspending our aid to you until you halt what you are doing in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Southern Lebanon. I see no evidence that we will do that. On the contrary, what I see is our readiness now, once the Iranians have responded to the Israelis, remember, they have been waiting to launch a counter strike in any case for what happened weeks ago. Once mm. they attack, that's our cue, and I think you will see all our air and naval and missile power wow. engage against Iran. That will be a regional war. That will bring Russia in, and I think Turkey will have to make some hard wow, decisions. Wow. Wow. Scary times, Colonel. Scary. Colonel, you got me more alarmed than I was, but look, it's always a pleasure to speak to you. I'd love to have you on the show again, sir. Okay, and, good. And, nice uh, to and, meet and you. Pleasure's mine, sir. Pleasure's right. mine.